Awesome. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me, first and foremost? Excellent. Um, usually, I'm not using a microphone, and so I'm able to project my voice. I don't want to deafen you, though, so I'm going to try to keep it right here. Um, so first and foremost, um, I've always been told you never want to show up to a party empty-handed. So, but I'm not going to just give things away. I like to make people work for it. So I've got a series of questions, and if you can answer the question correctly, I'm going to give you one of my books because also I, you know, shamelessly self-promote. So first question I have for the group, if anyone can tell me, in 2025, we are estimated to have a cybersecurity cost of what? What is the total cost of cyber incidents going to be to the industry in 2025? Yes, ma'am. Three billion. Three billion. Six billion. Twenty-five billion. Twenty-five billion. Good. Two trillion. How many? How many trillions? Three to four trillion. Anybody else? One more. Good. One point two. The actual answer, 2025, price is right, right, $1, um, $10.5 trillion. 2025 cyber incidents are going to cost $10.5 trillion globally. 2023, the estimate, $8 trillion. So, three to four trillion is the closest. Yeah. All right. Giveaway number one. Giveaway number two. Currently, ransomware. Each individual ransomware attack, what is the average cost? Not including the ransom payment. 50 million. 50 million, okay. Anybody else? We can do one dollar, go ahead. 300 million. And this is average per company. Okay, anybody else? One dollar. All right, I like that answer. Four and a half, five. All right. The actual retail price, $4.35 million. So I think gentlemen in the back, I'll hold on to it. We'll, we'll get it later. So $4.35 million. Importantly, that does not include the ransom payment, which can go up to the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'll get to that in a second. Last question and last giveaway. What percentage of cyber attacks or cyber incidents writ large are driven by social engineering? Sir? 90. 90. 91. 93. 89. 97. 7 cents. Oh, I thought you said 7 cents. And I was like, all right, we'll throw a, we'll throw a value in there. 95. Anybody else? You said 97? 98%. 98% of cyber incidents are driven by social engineering. Now, why does that matter? Why are we here? AI, right? We love talking about LLMs. We love talking about ChatGPT, OpenAI, GPT-4, all the different capabilities and the wonderful things that come from AI and ML. I am here to tell you a darker tale. I am here to tell you about all of the issues that come along with AI because it's not all rainbows and butterflies. I'm sorry. So with that, can you go to the next slide? Do I have a next slide? I do, excellent. So I'm much more of a talker and I like having an open dialogue as opposed to really sticking to a script and so they asked me to give, put together some slides. So I put together one and these are the topics we're gonna cover. If anybody has any questions along the way, please feel free to stop me because I much prefer an open dialogue than me just doing a monologue. But here we go. Importantly, as we address cybersecurity, this is the what I want you to keep, there are two things that I want you to keep in the forefront of your mind. The first is military prowess depends on technological progress. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you connect to the internet, you are on the battlefield. Here we go. The first issue I have up here, cybersecurity landscape. So let's talk about it. Cybersecurity landscape has changed dramatically over the past several years and certainly over the past several months. And what's driven that? Anybody? What is driven 
the cybersecurity landscape, the major changes that have occurred over the past several months to years? Sir. Social media. Data. Using more technology, yeah. So, go ahead. Accessibility. Accessibility. So all of these things, right? Lowering the, lowering the bar to entry. How about geopolitically? There's a country called Ukraine kind of going through a thing right now. Um, all of these things matter. All of these things drive cybersecurity issues and drive incidents. And the reason why this is important is because as we look internally, and a lot of us when we talk about AI, ML, or we're looking at cybersecurity issues, we very much look at ourselves in isolation. We look at ourselves as an island. If we're looking at our company, we're looking at our firewalls, we're looking at the rules we have in place. If we have MSPs or MSSPs, we're looking at them. We're making sure we hit industry standards. We're focused, boresighted on regulations. I'm an attorney, believe me. Everyone's boresighted on regulations and what's required of them. But how many people actually take into account what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in Taiwan, when they're starting to think about their cybersecurity threat risk models? How many hospitals do you think are thinking to themselves, I really hope the Russian intelligence services don't hit me today? How many water treatment plants? How many electric companies? But every single one of them have the opportunity to be a part of this cyber battlefield. And this is something that we really don't focus a lot on, and it's important. And it's important for a lot of reasons. We're seeing a significant uptick in ransomware activity right now, primarily from Eastern Europe. 70% in 2022, 70% of all ransomware payments went to Russia or wallets that were in Russia. That shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. The reason being is because the Russian government allows ransomware actors to operate with impunity. Why? Because it destabilizes us. They don't necessarily have to direct their cyber forces to target U.S. interests, target the U.S. military, the defense supply chain, or critical infrastructure if they have criminal actors who are going to do it for them. That also throws a wrench into our analysis of international law, because can we respond with force if a Russian ransomware actor targets our critical infrastructure or happens to take out a water plant in Tampa just before the Super Bowl? The answer is no, we can't. Just like terrorism, you can't respond with force against a nation state for something that they did not do. If it was not their military forces, you cannot respond to them. The other aspect of it is, much of what our adversaries are doing in cyberspace is conducted not by their militaries, but by their intelligence organizations. So Russian SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service. How many people have heard of SolarWinds? SolarWinds? SolarWinds, a very famous software development company. Um, they have something called the Orion Software. Well, a little while ago, the SVR, the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, compromised SolarWinds and compromised the Orion Software specifically in an update that went out they were able to effectively put a backdoor into 18,000 companies via the SolarWinds update, including the Department of Defense, Department of Treasury, Department of State, as well as many critical infrastructure sectors. But because this was conducted by an intelligence agency, this wasn't considered an act of war. Well, what distinguishes an act of war from something that is simply espionage, something that the CIA would do, for instance? And the answer is, did it go boom? Because something that looks exactly like cyber warfare also looks exactly like espionage, also looks exactly like cybercrime. And until it goes boom, we don't treat it as warfare and we can't respond. And so the point of the book in general, and again, shameless plug here, those of you who have one enjoy it, those of you who don't, please buy it. The point of it is everything we do, everything we do online can be touched by a nation state adversary and we need to start thinking about it in, the, in that context. And so now, when we say cyber warfare, a lot of people look at it and they think to themselves, well, that's something that's the military's problem, right? That's US Cyber Command. That's why we have the military. If there was an intercontinental ballistic missile coming towards my facility, I would expect the Air Force to shoot it down or the Army to shoot it down. You don't expect me to have a surface-to-air missile that's gonna intercept that, that ICBM, right? However, if it's a nation state and they're targeting your critical infrastructure, if they're targeting your network or your supply chain, suddenly that's your problem. This is the only place where national security is the responsibility of individual companies, and it's never going to change. And so that's a problem, because now we look at it as we have e-crime, and we need to protect ourselves, and so we ensure. 
or we get MSBs or MSSBs or we get the latest technology, the latest capabilities to try to improve our defenses. And in reality, the, the adversary really just needs to be right one time. We need to be right every single time. It's kind of an unfair advantage because you have nation states who are able to target individual companies within the US, and they do, and they are, but they're able to target them in the military or federal law enforcement or the intelligence agencies don't necessarily have the tools or the authorities to fight back. So that leaves us in an interesting place. And this is kind of where AI, ML come in. So on the risk side, and again, I like to start with the doom and gloom, and so we're gonna get there, and then I, I swear we're gonna finish on a bright note. On the risk side, and this is open for anyone, if you had to say, what is the number one risk that comes from artificial intelligence as it relates to cybersecurity? What would you say, sir? Fishing. Fishing. Ex well, hang, hang on, expand upon that. We're gonna get to that, I like this information too, good. Expand upon that. So this is important, this is why I asked you to expand upon it. And so when you say phishing, I think LLMs. I think the ability of a Russian non-US, non-English speaker being able to craft very tailored phishing emails, spear phishing emails targeting individuals in individual sectors or with individual proclivities. You know, you like fly fishing, I like fly fishing. Let's talk about fly fishing. Well, I just so happen to be a Russian cyber actor, I know nothing about fly fishing. So I'm gonna go into chat GPT, I'm gonna have him write up a whole email about fly fishing and suddenly we're buds. So that's good, hang on, I, can I address one thing? But what you were talking about is something different. What you were talking about is the use of AI models to send spear phishing campaigns or to coordinate those campaigns, which is wholly different. And that's something that's a much more advanced capability, but something that is equally, if not more, concerning. Because when you get to that aspect of it and you start talking about the ability to no longer just send individual messages or even have a bot army that's sending messages, but sending tailored messages en masse to hundreds of thousands of individuals, that changes the game completely because now you're opening up networks worldwide. Anybody who clicks on those more tailored, more advanced spear phishing messages, suddenly as a ransomware actor, as a malicious actor, you've opened up those networks completely. And remember, 98% of all cyber incidents result from social engineering. Game changer, ma'am. So backdoor attacks and data poisoning. I'm gonna get to data poisoning. So put a pin in that, but I love that answer. Right, that Nigerian prince who is using terrible grammar. Do you know why they use terrible grammar? Because they don't want the people who are gonna spot the terrible grammar because they're not gonna be the ones who send the money. They want the morons who are gonna completely gloss over the fact that it's terrible grammar and think to themselves, well, maybe there is a Nigerian astronaut just circling the, has been circling the globe for the past eight years and I need to get him down. <laughs> By the way, that's real. That's a thing. So you said disinformation. Oh, oh, I love this. Tease this out a little bit. What's the number one app right now? in the uh, either Google Play Store or the Apple Store? TikTok. What's the problem with TikTok? Of the myriad problems. Let's pick, let's pick your favorite problem with TikTok. China, yeah, that's, that's a major problem with TikTok. Exactly. And so what is TikTok? Well, TikTok is two things. Number one, it's an incredible collection tool. 
My God, if NSA had the ability to collect the amount of information that TikTok collects on a daily basis and shares with the Chinese government, it would never need Section 702. <laughs> the Snowden revelations, nobody would care about because all of those tools would be completely obsolete because of the amount of data that TikTok is able to collect. We'll come back to that, that very important point. The other aspect of it is, what else is TikTok? It is a megaphone. Because it can individually target anybody, and there are 140 million active daily users in America alone of TikTok. 140 million, do you know how many Americans there are? What, 330, 330 million? So 40% of our population is on TikTok. If you're an adversary country, and you want to individually target 40% of your primary competitor or your adversary with propaganda to undermine their democracy or presidential election or really anything else to sow discourse, to drive racial divides, you have the perfect tool to do it in TikTok. And it reaches everyone. And not only do you have the perfect tool, but with the massive data sets that are now available to the Chinese government, and I say Chinese government, and I'll get to why, to bite dance, right? To bite dance to TikTok. Bite dance is TikTok's parent company. The amount of data that's available to them is ungodly. And it's ungodly because they're looking at facial recognition, they're looking at the gate, all of those dances. They're doing gate recognition. They're looking at the way in which you type information into your phone. They're looking at the other things that are open on your phone. And so if you have your browser open, if you have Safari on your iPhone, they're pulling all of that information. Please read the terms of service if you, if you use TikTok. 48 hours later, come back to me and tell me what you learned. They take everything. They also take things that are copied to your clipboard, such as usernames and passwords, or just passwords, I guess, in most cases. They also take your contacts. But all of that is going into a very large data set from which they can specifically target you for advertisements. This is the ad economy. This is how it works. This is how Google works. This is how Meta works. I always get the question, well, what's the difference between TikTok, <clears throat> excuse me, between TikTok and Facebook, or TikTok and Twitter, or TikTok and Instagram, what's the difference? Here's the answer. In the United States, we have this thing called the Fourth Amendment. We have this thing called rule of law, and the law exists to protect not the government, but to protect individual rights and civil liberties. So the government can never go to Meta, can never go to Google, can never go to Twitter or X and say, hand over all of this data without a warrant, without a subpoena, without a court order. Because any of those companies, they can voluntarily turn it over, but they're not beholden to. China, flip that on its head. The Chinese Communist Party exists to support itself. And what I mean by that is there are a series of laws that began taking play, or began coming into play in 2015. The National Intelligence Law, the National Security Law, and the Cybersecurity Law. In total, these laws give the Chinese Communist Party the ability to go to any company operating in China or headquartered in China and say, you will provide me access to your network, you will provide me access to your data. You must support national security upon request. There is no warrant process, there is no subpoena process, they can't say no. If they say no, they are shut down. Case in point of this, anybody notice what happened to Apple recently? It was a big, yeah, big change, right? Yep, because it was with Foxconn, that was our exclusive producer. Well, suddenly they started moving their production. China didn't like that because now they can't access those data centers anymore. And so Apple, which was, had the data centers for all of the population in China where they were using iPhones, those data centers had to be localized in China. Reason being is because they wanted the Ministry of Public Security to have access to that data. So when, Chi when, when um, Apple decided they were gonna start moving out, China said, well, in that case, we are banning iPhones and the use of Apple devices from all of our government agencies and all state-owned entities, meaning just about every company in China can no longer utilize Apple phones. And oh, by the way, at the same time, Huawei just came out with its brand new 5G phone, which now they're, they're moving towards. So there are, there are significant, significant impediments to not listening to the Chinese Communist Party um, if you're operating there. So TikTok in general, Huge issue because it's a megaphone. And from a data perspective, well, ByteDance is a company that specializes in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so what does ByteDance need? Constant data streams, right? Well, if you look at, I think it's the top five apps right now in the US, OpenAI, ChatGPT is up there. But it's, 
It is um, TikTok, Timu, which I only learned about at the Super Bowl this year during the commercials that kept rolling through, um, which made me Google what the hell is Timu. Um, <clears throat> Timu is an alt a Chinese alternative to Amazon. Um, and then the third one is a video editing tool for TikTok, all of which are owned by ByteDance and operated by ByteDance. So all of that data that flows in is accessible to the Chinese Communist Party. Well, for AI, what do you need? You need huge troves of training data, right? So the Chinese have 1.4 billion people in there within the, the, the continent or the, the mainland China. The problem, though, is the vast majority of that 1.4 billion are Han Chinese. In order to do facial recognition, you need to have a much larger data set. Well, in order to get that larger data set, you have to have access to other faces or people that look different. And so now we have TikTok, which is worldwide. We also have the Belt and Road Initiative, where the Chinese are exporting safe, smart cities all over the continent of Africa, across Europe. And what these are, it's facial recognition, um, facial recognition cameras and technologies that identify threats or risks or criminal activity on the streets and immediately report it to law enforcement. Where does all that data go? Now you're starting to see the, the picture of, of the problem with data and the dark side of AI. We are currently in a race with our primary adversary as it relates to artificial intelligence. They very much see, China namely, very much sees the benefit of AI, both from a military perspective, from an intelligence perspective, but also from a full-scale warfare perspective. We look at warfare in five different phases. Phase zero is basically steady state. Phase one is you're moving forces into theater. Phase two, you're actually engaging in warfare, so on. The Chinese and the Russians look at it across a much broader spectrum. This is what we call gray zone warfare. We started seeing this in 2016 during the presidential election where we had the Internet Research Agency, which was uh, funded by the late Prigozhin, um, and we saw the Russian GRU, the military intelligence unit for, for Russia, um, conduct coordinated cyber attacks against the Democratic National Committee and the DCCC. Um, specifically John Podesta, then candidate Clinton's chief of staff, compromising his email. And we saw the Internet Research Agency taking that email, sharing it directly with WikiLeaks, and sending it out to Americans at a timing and tempo they're choosing, which just so happened to, to uh, coincide with when the President Trump and Billy Bush video came out in early October, for those of you who remember all of this. Um, that was a coordinated campaign to undermine our democratic process. Whether it was to support one candidate or another, doesn't matter. It was a coordinated campaign using data, using a, a combination of cyber, cyber attack, cyber warfare, collection, cyber incident, whatever you want to call it, and big data and malign influence. Now you take that and you add artificial intelligence, you add capabilities like TikTok, and you add capabilities like Timu, where we're, we're, we're looking at commercial activity or we're looking at the ability or uh, individuals who are making purchases. And now suddenly you can specifically tailor messages to them, or if they're making purchases, you can specifically tailor advertisements to them that are laced with malware. All of these are within the possibility or within the realm of the possible, and it's what our adversaries are moving towards as it relates to artificial intelligence um, and as it relates to different phases of warfare. So for individual companies, what does all this mean? Because now we've got the, the doom and gloom, let me make sure I'm on time. Now we've got the doom and gloom of we have adversary nations engaging in what amounts to cyber warfare from malign influence to ransomware to full on warfare and something that goes boom and compromising our networks for those purposes. And if I'm telling you that every company's on the battlefield, what does that mean for the companies? Well, it means that we need to go and protect ourselves, right? Well, how do we do that? As our adversaries are increasingly utilizing artificial intelligence and increasingly utilizing capabilities that are driven by machine learning, and when I say adversaries, I'm lumping in e-crime groups like ransomware groups that are used essentially as proxies of the Russian government, for instance. What are companies to do? Well, you can only fight AI with AI. As we continue to look at the, the castle and moat defense of kind of the, the bygone era of Web 2.0, it's no longer sufficient. 
it's no longer sufficient to have a firewall and say my internal network is secure and I'm just going to look for the bad actors who are trying to penetrate my, my firewall. If you're a bank teller and you have somebody that comes up and you have a wanted poster right next to you and it's a really rough looking guy with a beard, a cowboy hat, and that guy walks into the bank, you're going to push the, the silent alarm very quickly because you're going to know that's a criminal, likely he's going to be trying to rob the bank. If an old lady with a walker comes into your bank and then slowly reveals that she's got a revolver and says, put the money in the bag, are you going to have time to push the button? That's the world we live in. Antivirus and the way the traditional cyber tools and cybersecurity tools work is they look for the known bad. We have all these CVEs that come out. We have all of these vulnerabilities that are consistently posted, that are consistently updated. I think we had over 5,000 last year alone that came out. All different vulnerabilities, great. These signatures, if you see them, you block them, you're safe. We are getting very, very quickly past that point. We're very quickly getting to the point where known vulnerabilities and identifying those signatures is insufficient because our adversaries are developing new attack methodologies, new capabilities, faster than we can defend against them. And so as our perimeter evaporates and has evaporated, we need to start looking for tools that are going to be commensurate with the threat. And those tools are driven by AI. And so what do I mean? Whenever you have an attack on your network, whenever you're facing some sort of risk, some sort of threat, whether it's from a phishing email or whether it's from a compromise of your domain name server or whether it's any of myriad other, other threats, the typical way we do it is we identify what bad looks like. Well, more and more we have threat actors who are utilizing techniques called living off the land, meaning they sit in your network and they identify what are the normal tools, what are the things you're using. And so if you're using things like Screen Connect or AnyDesk or any of these other remote management tools, well, they're going to use those same tools. They're going to use those from system administrator accounts that they've compromised, so it looks normal, so they blend in. And they do this to make sure that you, they're not identified by the normal scans of the system. So this is all manual versus manual. Artificial intelligence, when you start to inject it in there, they're not going to have to do that. The tools that are going to be compromising networks, it's no longer going to be individual sitting on the keyboard trying to masquerade as what's on that network. It's going to be a piece of code that is morphing as it goes and that's constantly changing, that's learning from your network and learning all of the different capabilities you have. And so when we have our cybersecurity teams that identify something that looks anomalous and they put it in a sandbox, if it's AI driven, suddenly it's going to go quiet and it's going to look like everything else, and it's not going to report back to its command and control server, and it's not going to be looking for any sort of cues to detonate. It's just going to sit silent because it's going to recognize that it's in a virtual machine. If it's in a healthcare environment, it's going to know it's in a healthcare environment, it's going to look for patient records, and it's going to specifically target those to encrypt. So how do we identify these? Well, artificial intelligence. That's, that, that really is the answer. And so moving towards this next step, we need to identify what is the data that we're going to be using. What are these massive data sets that we need to start training these large models, these, these tools? And the data is going to come from the private sector itself. And it's going to come from rapid sharing of that type of information. And so you'll see on there, I've got private industry, first line and front, for front line and first responders. Absolutely. And that comes to the point that Every company, every organization is now facing these threats. It's no longer just a military issue. It's no longer just a law enforcement issue. But where we actually get the data and where this is important is the public-private partnership. Because the FBI doesn't have access to the data for the reasons I mentioned. The FBI can't just go up to Meta and say, give me your data. They can't go to CrowdStrike and say, give me all of the threat data or all of the indicators of compromise or signatures that you've seen. If CrowdStrike or if individual companies at the end of a ransomware attack want to provide that to the, to the FBI, they can do so voluntarily. But we don't have a mechanism that forces that. And so that data, without that data, we can't develop these models. And so the public-private partnership piece is absolutely critical. And this is where, as a nation, we need to move. We need to start recognizing that we no longer should be looking as, at the government as a huge threat. We no longer should be having this public-private divide. 
because without working together, we're not going to be able to access the data that's necessary to create the tools that are going to defend us in the future. And those tools are artificial intelligence. Those tools are driven by machine learning. And without those data sets, we simply can't access it. So, am I on time? I'm on time. After action. So what comes? What comes next? Where are we going? We're going to start a little bit with doom and gloom again, because that's always my favorite. So the doom and gloom of this, again, what comes next? Well, let's start thinking through what, what is AI-driven cyber attack? What does an AI-driven cyber attack look like? And I talked about kind of the, the morphing malware, the malware that's going to change depending on what's being applied to it in the environment. But what else? What's it targeting? And so in, back in 2022, we had, there was a cyber attack against the Oldsmar, Florida water treatment facility right before the Super Bowl in Tampa. This was the one I think Tom Brady was like his last Super Bowl. It was a hometown team. And the water treatment plant, somebody suddenly saw the mouse moving across the screen. Um, I've heard different, different characterizations of the event that it wasn't what it was cracked up to be. I've talked to the FBI agent who led the investigation. It was absolutely what it was cracked up to be. So let's say you deploy malware to a water treatment facility. And that malware is driven by AI. Well, an individual threat actor right now would have to be an expert in that type of critical infrastructure. They would have to fully understand how the operational technology, those industrial control systems work in order to really manipulate them to the degree that number one, it's either not detected until the harm is done, or number two, they are able to get in, do the damage, and get out without leaving any footprints. Using AI to compromise something like that, you no longer have to have that expertise. You can train a model to go into any network, any piece of critical infrastructure, to learn the network, learn what it does. You can train it on different types of critical infrastructure, but it will very quickly identify what is the operational technology, what is the most critical piece, what are the normal operating levels, and how do I change it just enough so that it's not observable? It's gonna cause harm, but it's gonna be not observable until we need it to be. That's where we're going. Think about that in healthcare. How many people are familiar with, with either not, not telemedicine, but the medical devices that require connectivity to the internet, things like pacemakers, or there are now Bluetooth connected um, insulin, I forget what they're called, the, the insulin injection. Familiar with these? Right. So these are all back end, the back end servers for all of these are, are hardened and necessarily so, and the FDA just came out with new cybersecurity requirements for all of these different types of technology. Well, every one of them, we know, ultimately, are going to be vulnerable. But how vulnerable, and what does that mean? Well, let's say you know that there is a, you know, we have an aging legislature, or legislature, legislature, there's that word. Our Congress is comprised primarily of senior citizens. That's not surprising. Well, how many of them do you think have certain types of medical technology that they use on a regular basis? What if you could very very narrowly target every member of our Congress who have medical technology. And you could very specifically target it so that as soon as there is a vote that's coming to the floor that's really important, maybe the vote to defend Taiwan, and then you're able to tweak their medical technology just so, so that their heart rate goes up significantly or drops. You have members of Congress who are passing out on the floor such that the, that vote can never actually come to the floor, or you can't complete that vote. That's not something that's out of the realm of the possible, because these AI models are able to go into the database to identify very narrowly individuals who that technology is connected to and how their specific medical technology functions in such a way that you tweak it just so, so it doesn't kill them, but it causes the effect that you're looking for across the board. Not out of the realm of the possible, but this, these are the types of threats that we're facing in the future from AI. And this is why it's so important as we develop these technologies to be looking also at how do we defend against them? How do we identify when you have an AI-driven malware, you have AI-driven ransomware, that we can identify when it's on the network and be able to neutralize it in its, in its steps? That's really hard. That's a really hard challenge, but the only way to do it is with AI. 
You can't do that manually. You can't identify those things manually. So critically important. The other thing that comes next, and this one is a little bit, it's equally important, but it's a little bit more of a kind of an upper. The other thing that comes next is the fact that we have an incredible amount of talent across the country. We certainly need more. Right now, there's any, I've heard numbers between 400,000 and 700,000 cybersecurity jobs that are currently going unfilled. Of those who are familiar with or who are experts when it comes to AI development is incredibly small. And so the, the number of cybersecurity professionals that we have who are proficient in developing artificial intelligence tools is even more insufficient than the number of cybersecurity professionals right now. So what that means is we need to better educate ourselves. We need to better educate our population. We need to focus more on ensuring that the next generation has the tools and the capabilities that they need. And so looking at the ground level and working with things like open AI, and working with things like large language models and familiarizing our younger generations with this is AI, this is how it functions, this is how you develop it, this is how it works, is critically important. It's not just important for business, certainly important for that, but from a security perspective. If we don't have a generation growing up that understands how, how these tools work, then we're, gonna have, we're going to lose what is the next war because it's going to be fought with AI tools. I guess that wasn't an upper. That's kind of doom and gloom too, huh? The good news is we have time. Not a lot of time. 2020, in, in November 2022, when ChatGPT came out, look at the change in our, our societal landscape in under a year. I mean, AI became one of those in, in the future type tools to something that's now being used regularly, widely, across all industries, and it's in a topic of debate and conversation regularly. So we don't have a lot of time, but we have a lot of tools and a lot of things at our, our disposal. So for everyone in the room, things that the, the key takeaways here are, number one, don't forget cybersecurity as we're talking about AI, because it's something that can be used against us, and it's something that, we, that is critically important for our defense going forward. Number two, public-private partnership is something that's an absolute imperative as we move more and more into the age of AI, because that's the only way that we are going to effectively defend ourselves from a national security perspective, is being able to provide that right type of data to the, either the federal government or to those who are developing these tools. And number three, don't forget about the next generation. Because the next generation, from an AI perspective, it's great, that's the workforce, that they're going to be the ones who are driving innovation. They're also going to be the ones who are securing our network. And we need to make sure that we are effectively teaching and training the next generation on how to do it. And in that way, we will be most prepared to face the cyber battlefield.